Hello and welcome once again to uh, the New Testament lectures. I want to uh, tell everyone I appreciate uh, everything that you all are doing in the forums and in your blogs. Also, a uh, good job on the midterm. I do want to let you know that if anybody would like to bring up their midterm grade, you can retake the midterm. It's in the same spot that it was before. It's called something like Improve Your uh, Midterm Grade. And you just click on that, and it's the same midterm, but there's no time limit. And you can um, use whatever you want uh, to use as far as your books and notes. Uh, all I want is you to uh, write down the correct answer, uh, just pretty much. Uh, it is a study tool. It's not designed for me to uh, enjoy looking at answers, but uh, anyway, if you want to improve your grade, you can uh, do so. You can improve it by up to 10 points on that in that exercise, which will bring you up in a letter grade, basically. So uh, it can really go a long way to help you. And, you know, you can learn more about the New Testament and also um, have a little fun. So anyway, let's get started. Uh, today we're going to be looking at, as you know, uh, we'll be looking at Ephesians and, not Ephesians, Romans, um, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians. Now, you should know that I, uh, I'm so sorry about this, I can't find where I'm at. Um, you should know that I did do my dissertation on 1 Corinthians which has a very close relationship with Romans. And uh, the reason for that is in Romans 16, Paul mentions like 26 people, and most of them have some kind of connection with Corinth. So um, I'm really excited about doing 1 Corinthians, and I'm very disappointed that I can't cover more. But uh, I could have lectured every class period of 1 Corinthians. Um, that's the way it goes. Uh, I have had a course on Romans in the PhD program at Bright, and also a class on First and Second Corinthians, and um, it had enough on those two to keep me studying for about 13 or 14 hours a day for 16 weeks. So there is a lot of material. A whole lot of people have written a lot of things on these uh, three documents. For Romans, it is the center of Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity. You know, it's in Romans where Paul has a fully developed doctrine of justification by faith, and also it's where we find election, and it has a lot of Christian ethics in it. But it is Paul's magnum opus. It's his greatest work. So let's get started. Uh, it was written in the spring of 56 from the house of Gaius in Corinth. And you'll remember from the lecture on Acts that there was a stone found uh, in Greece and it had an inscription on it. It, it referred to the uh, rule of a man named Gaius, I mean not Gaius, Gallio, who judged Paul in Acts. And New Testament scholars have used that stone to date everything in Paul because it's the only anchor that we have to reality or to history from the uh, Pauline literature. So, and it, it, it's not even mentioned in Paul, which is the ironic thing. It's mentioned in Acts, which people uh, view as not historical, but we have historical proof that this certain man was one of the judges of Paul. Uh, whenever Luke says he was. So New Testament scholars date bef both before and after uh, based on what the New Testament says about months and years. You know, like if it was six months later, we went this way. Or uh, then Paul visited thus and such city. Uh, the Gallio inscription is how we date. So we know with some certainty that Paul wrote it in the spring of 56 from the house of Gaius in Corinth. Now, the reason Paul wrote the letter 
was he was asking for support from the Christians in Rome. Now, the Christians in Rome were probably better off than Christians elsewhere. Um, and we know that because of all the people Paul mentioned. You know, there were a lot of house churches in Rome, and that takes a lot of wealthy people. So uh, the church enjoyed some success there, and uh, they still do today. And the, what he needed from them was support for a Spanish mission. You know, Paul wanted to keep going to Spain. And also, he's trying to get them to give significantly to the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, this might strengthen the bond between Gentiles and Jews. And I have that in parentheses because I don't know. Be, and the reason for that is we can't tell the difference archaeologically between Christians and Jews in Rome. The reason for that is the, the Christians embraced the Old Testament. And they used uh, stories from the Old Testament as art for their houses. You know, you've seen, I'm sure, uh, the story of Noah's Ark on walls and nurseries. Uh, it's interesting uh, that that's the case. But the early Christians were fond of Jonah. You know, Jonah went into the whale for three days, and then he was spat out. And that's a pattern for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So, the, uh, full, the separation between Christians and Jews in Rome was uh, very slow. It took about 250 years. We think that the Jews, the Jews and Christians lived together, uh, or the Christians were Jews that lived in the Jewish quarter of, of, of Rome. My computer fell asleep. You give a lecture and your computer falls asleep. Okay, anyway, in the outline that I present uh, later in the course, or in the course of the lecture, um, it's from Udo Schneller, who's a uh, very renowned New Testament scholar of our day. Um, he divides Romans into the doctrinal teachings of Paul and the horatory teachings. And horatory means urging for moral action. You know, Paul is urging the, uh, the Roman Christians to do what he wants them to do. And he's also teaching them a little bit of doctrine. Um, or a lot of doctrine, actually. Now, move down here to the second part, literary integrity. Uh, literary integrity means that Scholars are arguing about whether or not Romans is one writing. You know, that's, that is uh, all of it. But from Romans 1.1 1, 1 to 16.27, uh, or whatever the last number of the verse is, um, is it a single unit or at least two units? Now, I grew up thinking that uh, Romans 16 was addressed to the church at Ephesus because one of the one of the scholars and I remember who, what his name was it was Peter Lampa whenever I was a freshman at uh, Bright Divinity School I read that you know you have to be pretty much nuts to think that Romans 16 is actually a part of the original text and obviously the uh, the writer that I use today uh, Schneller he are used differently, and he are used it pretty well, I think. Uh, kind of think of it. I, I had I met him at an international conference one time. He's from Germany, and uh, I had him sign one of my my books. He wrote a book on Paul, and uh, now he's written two. Anyway, I lost that book, and it showed up at at the end of my program six years later. Uh, found it in the uh, common room. It looked like uh, other students had been using it as a textbook for about six years. So um, I, I love Schnelle. And uh, I, was, I can't use it as a textbook because it's, too, it's much, much harder than Metzger. Anyway. Okay, literary, unit, literary, literary integrity. Um, the earliest manuscripts 
Um, and the, on, the only gap that I can see, if you look down here, 1-1 one, one to 16-23, and 16-24 is missing, and then it has 25-27. Uh, to 27. That's the earliest manuscripts. And I didn't write them there because it's a bunch of, it, it's just illegible to you guys. You know, it, it's just symbols. But uh, they are the earliest ones. And then Marcion leaves out uh, chapters 15 and chapter 16, you know, uh, in total. The interesting thing about Marcion is he only accepted letters and gospels that arrived in his city first. That is, there's a, there was a Christian tradition, uh, you know, that his father and maybe his father's father had. They were all Christ, the Christian bishops in, in, in Sinope, I think. Um, they had this tradition where they only accepted the earliest and most genuine editions of Christian texts. So they only accepted the undisputed letters of Paul. You know, the letters that scholars pass off today as genuine, that's what Marcion accepted. And the letters that scholars today reject as Pauline, Marcion rejected them as Pauline. And Marcion is supposed to be a big evil uh, Gnostic who got excommunicated from the church in 144. But it looks like he had just a little bit of sense. You know, he, he wasn't as open as are the Christians to receiving a different edition of a text that they already had. You know, and it's just like today. You know, if somebody came to you with an extra chapter or two of Romans, would you accept it? You know, I don't, I wouldn't. And if it's, if it has been in your church for a hundred years before you see anything different, um, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty much the same thing. You know, just, uh, there's a lot more time uh, in between today, but we've only had the Bible for, you know, the course of our lives and our parents' lives. So, um, I mean, in as much as it directly relates to us. Uh, so then we look down, and I don't know, I, I looked this up, I actually stopped the lecture, it started over, so I could look up what the heck this means down here at the bottom, uh, you know, 1-1 through 1623, plus 1625 through 7, plus 161 through 23. Why isn't 161 through 23 before uh, 25 through 27? I don't know. Uh, that's the way Schnelli lists it. And uh, I, I, I've done twice the amount of work so far just to make sure that one little fact was right. Uh, and I did see that I got the notation wrong. It was, it's uh, P46 instead of 66. And as you remember, P means papyri. The point of this is to show you that the early manuscripts have uh, relatively significant differences in what to do with Romans chapter 16. And there are, there, there's about uh, four or five more examples that that Schneller gives. And it's a mess whenever you try to study this. A mess. Okay, now, I, like, I was brought up thinking that Romans 16 was addressed to people in Ephesus. And I know this sounds corny at the beginning, but a lot of people believe this, so this is something you need to know about Romans. Paul greets 16 people in Romans 16, who were uh, apparently unacquainted with him in 113. So it looks like uh, Paul is is greeting people that he doesn't know and that don't know him, and that kind of negates the purpose of uh, greeting them. If it is, if Romans 16 is actually to Rome. You don't want to greet people that aren't there, because that would completely negate the purpose of writing a letter, you know, asking for money. So that's that's one argument that Romans 16 is not originally part of Romans. Also, several people that he greets in Romans 16 we know live in Ephesus. Example is Aquila and Priscilla. We know that they lived in Ephesus 
at the time Paul was writing Romans because of, uh, they, of them being mentioned elsewhere. I believe in 1 Corinthians is the argument. And then um, Paul is greeting them in Romans 16, so th it doesn't make sense because we know that they're not in Rome. They're in Ephesus, as are a lot of other people. And I read, at, you know, that Peter Lampa told me that unless there was a major migration of Christians between Ephesus and Rome and then back to Ephesus, um, we cannot even consider that Romans 16 is part of the original epistle. Now, another thing that, con that convinced me was the tone of 16, 3 through, 3 through 16. It has a polemic against false teaching that uh, doesn't fit the rest of the epistle. You know, he gets pretty serious there at the end. Uh, and he is uh, very gentle and um, logical throughout uh, the rest of the text. And also, manuscript tradition excludes chapter 16. Now we saw that the earliest manuscripts included at least part of chapter 16, but uh, there is no manuscript tradition that excludes the, the entire thing, except for Marcion, uh, to my knowledge. So uh, I would say it's clearer to, write, to believe or understand that the manuscript tradition is highly irregular. You know, the, the manuscripts don't agree on uh, what to do with Romans 16. So it could be that a letter got attached to um, Romans. That can happen uh, in the collection of the works, especially if the people that who compiled it know that they, it was written by Paul. Um, you can have, you know, these letters being gathered together and then copied together somewhere else. But it looks like that would be a pretty radical thing to have happened. So I've changed my mind. Um, Romans, I believe, uh, with, along with a lot of other scholars, that uh, Romans is one letter. And the explanation, expl the reason why it's one that 16 would be included, we're going to answer that top, uh, that first point that Paul greets people that apparently do not know him. Well, people in Rome moved from Ephesus. Excuse me. All the Jews were kicked out of Rome in, I believe, in 52. And then in 54, uh, Claudius uh, let everybody come back. So there was a massive movement between Rome and Ephesus and back. Like uh, Lampa, uh, he made fun of that idea, but it's a historical reality. And Paul makes use of all his contacts in Rome. Uh, this, this one I found interesting. Uh, in, in the epistle, I think my computer fell asleep twice on me. In the epistle to Romans, the amanuensis, or the secretary, is mentioned. His name is uh, Tertius. And this is the only time in Paul's letters that he mentions the scribe. And the scholar that I read today uh, said that uh, Paul mentions him because he did such a good job copying 16 chapters. You know, it was no easy task to uh, take down the dictation for that many chapters, so Paul thanks him. And to me, Romans is a pretty long, difficult book, even if you just exclude chapter 16. It doesn't make it tremendously longer. So I thought that argument was interesting, but, you know, What's the difference between 14 chapters and 16 chapters? I mean, really, for Romans. Uh, you know, it's, it's not really that, that bad or that much of a difference. Okay, another thing is that Romans 1 through 5 and Romans 16 presuppose the same historical situation. 
That's a very complex argument. Um, and I think I'm going to move on. And there is no plausible reason why a letter to, to Ephesians ends up at the end of Romans. Now, that, that, those are the people that disagree, that, it's, that say, think it's impossible for two Pauline letters to get meshed together. And I think that's entirely uh, probable, and it probably even happened. But the arguments for uh, it being a separate letter, especially to a different city, and then uh, including it, are uh, it's pretty convincing to me that it was that it was one letter. But I don't like those uh, letter partition theories anyway. And partition means you chop it up. If you think that was confusing, wait till we get to Corinth. Okay, uh, one thing that will be interesting to you is the relationship between baptism in Romans and the mystery religions. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, the first one is directly from the text. This is, I hope, the NIV. Uh, Romans 6, 3 through 4. And it says, basically, uh, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism, in order that, just as Christ, raised, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of God the Father, we too may have new life. Okay, now, let's compare that to uh, some mystery religions. Um, the first one is from Isis, uh, initiation, and this, uh, this person here, this writer, uh, Aristophanes, is writing about the initiation rite into the mystery cult of Isis. It says, I drew near to the confines of death, treading, treading the very threshold of Persephone. I just love that literary flourish. I was born through all the elements and returned to earth again. At the dead of night, I saw the sun shining brightly. I approached the gods above and below and worshipped them face to face. Now, that's not a, a definite, exact parallel, you know, but you have the from uh, death to life. And baptism is the uh, intermediary or the, the tool that, that helps you go from uh, realize the, the uh, existential reality of going from death into life. And then uh, Firmicus Maternus. I've never read this person before. I've read Aristophanes quite a bit, but uh, the error of profane religions, 22, uh, and that just sounds like it's a Christian uh, priest. He's a priest of a mystery cult, though. That's what Udo Schnella says, and it says, "Rejoice, O mystai! Lo, our God, God appears as saved, and we shall find salvation springing from our woes." Now, if that's as close as we ever get to a mystery religion, we're doing okay. <laughs> and then, you remember, this describes repeated initiations and not uh, the single initiation that is in, the, uh, in Christianity, as described by Paul. Okay, uh, the theology of Romans begins with its uh, thesis statement in Romans 1. 16 through 7, 17. Uh, and then his argument goes on. And it's real, this is a really interesting argument. You know, he wants to uh, equate Gentiles and Jews, he want, or place them on the same level. And that is uh, the level of needing Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and, for, and the work of Christ to unify us with God. Now, he argues that the Gentiles may not have had the law. They didn't have Abraham giving them the law or the prophets. They could have seen in nature the character of God and worshipped him. But instead, they worshipped nature. So, and therefore, God gave them over to their lusts and uh, so on. So, they lived without God and they lived without the law. 
Now he spends a lot more time on Jews. And the reason for that is, uh, you know, Jews already thought they were sons of promise, and uh, they needed a little bit more uh, convincing. And also, they, they're probably answering, Paul is probably answering a threat of uh, Judaizers, you know, people that are trying to get Gentiles to follow the law. So he's coming down pretty hard on uh, this following of the uh, Mosaic Law. He says in chapter 2 that Jews are not saved by the law. They are actually, uh, the law condemns them. You know, they are, they are only learning from the law that they are sinners. So, the law failed the Jews. You know, he said earlier, uh, you know, the Gentiles didn't have the law, but they had nature. And Jews had the law and were not able to fulfill it. Therefore, both Gentile and Jew is in need of God's grace. So then we go to Romans 3. Um, he basically concludes on the previous arguments that there is no hope for humanity but the grace of God. And Jews and Gentiles both realize their salvation through God's grace. Chapter 4 talks about Abraham, which is the uh, foundation of his doctrine of justification by faith. That is the idea that um, we, are, we are saved uh, by grace through faith and not by the following of the law. And, we, and all people are justified before God by their faith in God. Now that can take us to universalism. And uh, it's taken my mind there a couple times. You know, that uh, God, because of God's infinite grace, all those who open up to God will receive, uh, receive the grace of God. You know, both now and in the afterlife. But Abraham is his primary example. Because Abraham comes before Jews and before Gentiles. And, and that is, uh, you know, he's a patriarch. He existed before, before the Jews had the law, and therefore uh, he is a really good example to look to. Now Abraham, he says, believed in God, and it was, a, it was accredited to him as righteousness. He didn't do anything else to receive God's favor, but believe in the words of God. Now it's hard to do. And uh, the reward is great. But it's pretty difficult. Abraham isn't like all of us. He followed God and believed in God so deeply that he became the foundation of a faith. Or three. Romans 6, he talks about uh, baptism. And we, we've read that earlier from death to life, which has parallels in the mystery religions. And then, in Romans 7 through 8, you have the situation of the Christian. And the uh, Christian is to be led by the Holy Spirit. And submit, submit to the Holy Spirit for um, the goodness of God. Okay, I'm tired of my computer falling asleep on me. Okay, and this, this is really critical. In, in Romans 7 through 11... Uh, Paul teaches that the election of Israel is still valid. And election means choice. You know, Israel is still the chosen people of God. Christianity does not supplant that. And uh, that's something that Christians have forgotten. You know, I'll never forget uh, whenever my professor was lecturing on this in, uh, in my Ph.D. program, he said... Um, he, he's been, he's a uh, tenured professor, and he said that he met with a uh, Jewish rabbi one time, and they got to talking about how he's, uh, he's studying the New Testament, and he's a Christian, and so on and so forth. And he told the rabbi, you know, this is a New Testament professor, tells a rabbi that 
He said, Rabbi, you teach me about God. I'm, I don't teach you about God. I want to learn from you. And I think that's very, very powerful. You know, that um, nobody really arrives at a perfect understanding of all of this stuff. But it's important to know that your, that your greatest teacher, if you're a Christian, Paul, wrote that the election of Israel is still valid. God is still working through Jews. So there's no reason to uh, have any animosity, uh, including in, insulting Jews by interpreting their scriptures for them. And that's something that uh, Christians have done uh, forever. And we need to be careful about offending our Jewish uncles, brothers, fathers, aunts. And also, uh, the goodness of God is part of in his uh, selection process. Uh, this is where we get a lot of the doctrines of predestination from Calvin. Uh, you know, God chooses us. Uh, despite everything that we do, he chooses us for grace to, by grace, to be his uh, servants in the world. And the goodness of God is contrasted to human unfaithfulness. And then in Romans uh, 12 the, and, and following are the general, uh, the general admonitions and the part about government authority, uh, weak and strong. Uh, and now this is interesting here, and you need to remember this, that the weak and strong in Romans 14 is different from the weak and strong in Corinth. Now, the uh, difference is, uh, well, the similarity first is they are probably both rich and poor. And the uh, difference is the Corinthians were... Uh, struggling with things that uh, the Roman Christians probably had never even thought of. You know, it's a completely different uh, focus and frame of mind with the um, with the Romans. But the end game is the same. You know, Paul talks about the weak and strong because he wants the church to be unified. You know, the church in Rome in Rome needs to be unified. Church in Corinth needs to be unified. He uses the same. Uh, metaphor, but it's slightly different. Um, and then in 15, Christ accepts accepts them, and then uh, work with the Roman Church is Romans 16. So uh, that's exhausting. So much stuff. So much stuff. Okay, justification by faith. Uh, the foundation is Abraham, as we talked about earlier. Um, you know, Abraham came before the law. He wasn't upholding the law or uh, forcing it on other people. He just believed God, and that was his righteousness. He didn't gain righteousness through following the law. And the same arguments in uh, Romans are, it's the same for relations for justification by faith. So, you, if you remember the uh, teachings of justification by faith in Galatians, they also appear in uh, Romans. Now, uh, weak and strong is different from Corinth. Uh, I said Paul identifies with the strong in, um, in Romans, and he identifies with the weak in Corinth. But uh, as I'm thinking about this, it, it looks like he identifies really with both of them in Corinth. And, uh, but he's, he tries to identify, he tries to uh, convince the strong by saying, you know, I'm strong too, or I'm stronger than you are, actually, and uh, I'm going to be unified with the weak person. So, uh, you should too. Okay, <clears throat> on to the gold. 1 Corinthians, written in Ephesus in the spring of 55. Okay, there are some very important differences between um, Galatians and Romans and 1 Corinthians. Now, I'm just going to go through these and then um, 
wrap it wrap it up and and talk about them a little with a little bit more clarity. Um, in First Corinthians, there is no trace of the understanding of the law in Galatians or in Romans, and because of that, scholars think that First Corinthians was written before Galatians and Romans because uh, the word law uh, doesn't appear in Second Corinthians at all. And it only appears eight times in four passages. So there's four passages in 1 Corinthians that talk about the law, and they mention them, you know, one or two times in each passage, or, you know, one, between one and three. I doubt it's two for every passage. And there are no similar metaphors or line of discussion, and that is uh, metaphors concerning the law, uh, or line of discussion concerning the law, as in Galatians. And there's also no justification by faith. So, there's this um, mythology in Greece about Athena, that she uh, burst out of Zeus's thigh fully developed. And so uh, professors will often say that Christianity did not burst out of Zeus's leg as Athena fully developed. Paul's theology did not burst out of his head fully developed. Now, for those of us who have grown up, like me, thinking that Paul is perfect, and he's giving us perfect scripture, uh, we can trace the development of Paul's thinking through his letters. He doesn't say the same thing in every letter. And it's not just because of the occasion. You know, it's not just because of the context. It's because... He's still working things out. And uh, in Romans, he has the height of his theological glory. And in uh, 1 Corinthians, we have to just uh, deal with what we have. Okay. There is a lot of talk about the people in Corinth. And the reason why is because a lot of people think that the Corinthian church was wealthy. There are good reasons to believe this. For one thing, the church is meeting in households. Now, we can compare this to 1 Thessalonians, where the, first Thess the Thessalonians are being persecuted, and they are not meeting in a house. Uh, they're probably meeting in, you know, the ancient world's uh, version of the apartment complex. It's called tenement housing. And um, they also did not have meals together, and the Corinthians did. And whenever Paul talks about that, he says, um, whenever you receive an invitation to dinner, blah, blah, blah. And I think that's uh, 1127 or 1124. Uh, he says, when you receive the invitation to dinner, Go there in confidence and eat whatever is put before you. But if they say this has been sacrificed to an idol, then you don't eat it. So the only people that did that were wealthy. And we have several examples of invitations that have the same format uh, that uh, Paul uses in 1 Corinthians when he talks about being invited. So there are those are just two reasons, and I'm going to give you some more. Uh, but it looks like Paul enjoyed quite a bit of success in Corinth. Now, the uh, first person who looks like he might be a candidate for being wealthy is Crispus, the synagogue leader. He's mentioned in... I can't remember where he's mentioned. I think he's in both Acts and 1 Corinthians. Um, he is only mentioned as a synagogue leader in Romans, I think in Romans 16. So, we have this uh, Crispus. The question is, is synagogue leader a person who has wealth? Uh, and the answer is, probably. Uh, you didn't have to be a wealthy, you know, really wealthy person in order to be a synagogue leader. But it did help. Because uh, part of your duties were, were to keep the synagogue going if the uh, donations got low, 
or just give because you like to do excuse me or just give because you like to uh, see the synagogue successful so he could be someone who's wealthy um, the only catch is um, synagogue leader was so, was given as a title to wealthy people and a lot of times they didn't even do anything um, and it was also given to we know from the papyri and the inscriptions from the ancient world that at least five or six kids you know people under the age of uh, 13 and sometimes even uh, I think there was one child who died in childbirth or he was uh, he didn't live to the age of one and he was a synagogue leader the reason why they got that title is somebody from their family gave to the synagogue which may mean that Christmas is wealthy so uh, I argued in my dissertation that we simply don't know it looks like he is wealthy but he's only mentioned in Acts so I, I was a uh, unsure earlier but now I'm pretty certain that he's only in Acts and um, because of that I can't really run with it um, the, and then there's Erastus the city treasurer now he's called a city treasurer by Paul and a lot of people think that uh, he was wealthy because of this and there's also uh, in can't remember when it was discovered offhand, but there is an, an Erastus inscription uh, from Corinth where he gave, uh, there's a little, uh, it looks like a little piece of sidewalk, and it says Erastus. And Christians had been quick to say, uh, this is the Erastus of 1 Corinthians. Now, the problem with this is, for one thing, you have to argue, and they do, that Erastus is a rare name, and it's not. You know, it was uh, all over Greece and in this time period, and son of a gun. And connecting the Erastus, uh, who, who uh, is in the inscription to the Erastus in the New Testament is very difficult to do. Now, I'll tell you why. The person who who uh, had that inscribed, it was Erastus, and he dedicated a, a whole sidewalk in Corinth uh, to, you know, the city and it was his benefaction and he's remembered forever by this little inscription. Now, that Erastus was undoubtedly wealthy, but the Erastus mission in the New Testament is the city treasurer, and that is the lowest of the lowest of the lowest uh, public office in Corinth. Um, it's in fact it's so low that slaves held that position, and if we're going to say that this is this Erastus was wealthy, um, and even he holds the title of Adel, uh, which is not in the New Testament. Adel is the title of the person whose name is on the sidewalk. You know, it says Erastus the Adel. Now, Adel is a much higher position, and he would have, this Erastus, the city treasurer, would have had to make a meteoric rise in um, in Corinthian city life in order to be the same Erastus as the guy that that put his name on the sidewalk. Now this is something that I thought was really really interesting. Um, the son and the stepmother in chapter 5. You know there was an incestuous relationship between a stepmother and her, and her stepson. Now what happened, what probably happened was the uh, son's father uh, married a young woman probably about the age of 15 or 16 and the son was probably about the same age and uh, his father died so uh, he lived with his stepmother who was about the same age as he was and they started a uh, love affair 
Now, because of this man dying, you know, the son's father, the stepmother and son would have been vulnerable to lawsuits. You know, when a man dies in the ancient world, uh, he probably owes a few people money, or a few people want his money, so there can, there could be a lot of uh, lawsuits. And that's probably what was happening in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, uh, Christians in the church were seeing the vulnerable um, nature of this relationship and were suing the uh, stepmother and stepson for the um, legacy or inheritance of, and property of the deceased father. So it looks like from... 1 Corinthians, that the church didn't really care about this setup. Um, it's not a relationship that was praised in Greco-Roman literature. You know, most writers, in fact, probably all writers look down on it. Um, stepmothers were usually seen as evil, and um, they were known to seduce stepsons, and uh, it's something that was ingrained in the sons to stay away from because those step stepmothers can uh, really uh, rip you a new one. So I think that's the strongest argument for wealth in 1 Corinthians is uh, the lawsuits because it took a lot of money to sue people. You know, just like today, you know, a lot of people uh, can't go to court can't bring cases to court because they don't have the money to uh, pay everybody whose hand is in the cookie jar. And justice is a joke, uh, especially in situations like this. But it looks like the Corinthians um, didn't mind having this uh, stepmother and stepson around, even, even in light of their um, behavior. So they were integrated into the community of the church, and therefore the church probably knew about their financial situation and sought to exploit it. Okay, Aquila and Priscilla are seen as wealthy. Man, I gotta change that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Aquila and Priscilla are uh, seen as wealthy because they travel all the time. You know, they uh, make a lot of journeys in the New Testament, and apparently they live in a couple of pl different places, like Ephesus and Corinth and Rome. So uh, it's argued by some people that because Aquila and Priscilla, or Prisca as Paul calls her, uh, because they travel so much, they must be wealthy. And a lot of research, in fact, all the research on ancient travel indicates that uh, poor people could travel more easily than wealthy people. The reason for that is wealthy people uh, get, often get robbed on the road. They're bandits. Uh, you know, bandits will see the wealthy person traveling because it's pretty easy to spot you know, someone traveling in style. Um, and all the senators that traveled complained about this. You know, they had to pay a lot of people off, or they lost all their slaves, or they would uh, lose everything. You know, the, the senator would get killed, and his children, and everybody who's traveling with them, um, so that uh, people could take their stuff. So wealthy people did not travel all that often. Um, they sent representatives to do it, uh, or uh, poor people could... Uh, you know, travel in mass. You know, they would have a whole caravan of people, not just, you know, the wealthy person, but there would be a wealthy person, all the slaves, and then, you know, 30 or 40 other people that need to travel between Corinth and Rome, for example, and they can together fight off um, people that are hiding behind the hiding behind stuff and uh, wanting to kill them. So, the thing is about Aquila and Priscilla, they were tent builders. And so is Paul. And a tent builder can travel easily. You know, not that they, uh, I just thought this off the top of my head, not that they can just pitch a tent wherever they want, 
but um, they only had a few tools and they worked with very common materials leather and maybe wool and they were needed everywhere you know they they were used by uh, wealthy people for shade and we know in Rome in the Colosseum they had you know it was like the Superdome you know they they had a uh, canvas that would go out and cover uh, the people as they watched uh, gladiators kill each other uh, so it was easy for them to travel there was always work for them to do it paid uh, you know reasonably well they were above the sustenance level at least and uh, they were able to travel so that's not an indicator of wealth however St Stephanus and Gaius are mentioned you know we said earlier that uh, the book of Romans was written in Corinth in the house of Gaius um, and uh, Stephanus also had ho a house that uh, the church could meet in now there's a lot of debate on the size of the houses, you know, and therefore the nature of early Christian worship. You know, was it 15 people? That is, the amount of people who can fit in the uh, dining area comfortably. Um, and you say 15, but then people could sit on the floor or uh, stand up. But if it's comfortable, it's going to be 15. Uncomfortable, probably up to 30. Uh, depending on how uh, close people want to get. Now, some people argue that the early Christians met in uh, the atriums of houses, which is a huge area. You know, and, and you look at a Roman peristyle house, they have that big, huge courtyard in the middle. And uh, one of my professors wrote many years ago that he thought 300 people could fit inside of one of these uh areas and that's if they were standing standing shoulder to shoulder and, and just crammed in there um, anyway he's corrected that and said 45 so from 300 to 45 but whether it's 15 people you know 15 to 30 people inside a dining room or people inside an atrium there has to be a wealthy homeowner who uh, could facilitate um, this group of people and by facilitate I mean uh, have the uh, food and the protection and and uh, anything else that the church needed um, and that place to meet you know you have to have a home if you're going to meet in a home so uh, Stephanus and Gaius are identified as homeowners so uh, they're probably uh, the wealthiest people in the church and then there's Phoebe the patroness. Now Phoebe is near and dear to my heart because she is mentioned as a patroness in Romans 16. Um, there is an example of another woman being called patroness and that is Junia Theodora. She was a patroness in Corinth. Man, that's irritating. Um, she was a patroness in Corinth, and by uh, patroness, that is someone who supports the church, and they get something in return. You know, Phoebe supported Paul. Um, some people argue, actually, a guy named Jewett argues that Phoebe funded Paul's Spanish mission. And uh, I think that's a little, excuse me, a little premature, but... Uh, it is interesting that somebody thinks that. But Junia Theodora had five inscriptions um, dedicated to her in Corinth. And it was just a little bit after the time of Paul. You know, maybe 50, 40 or 50 years after Paul was here, uh, Junia Theodora was active. And she was given honors by uh, five local cities for uh, protecting them from their governor. You know, it was the cities in Lycia. You know, she was protecting other people from persecution and giving them shelter in her household. And she was given a crown, a gold crown, for her apotheosis, which means whenever she becomes a goddess or whenever she dies. Um, that theodosis uh, was used as sort of like rest in peace. You know, it's like on, all, on every tombstone. You know, it doesn't really mean 
uh, have a great meaning. But the point of all that is there are people who think that uh, Phoebe Patronus and it's prostatis in Greek. That doesn't really refer to the same thing as if it were a man. You know, like if it, if uh, Stephanus was called patron, he would have been wealthy and uh, important to the church. But Phoebe, because she's a woman, uh, it has been argued that it just means um, like a co-worker or a, uh, someone who serves alongside. You know, it... it it is not normally translated or approached as uh, a patroness, even though it's the Greek word for patroness. Uh, now, it is rare, uh, but it's not a unique usage, and it's something that Paul would have been familiar with. Looks like we're going to have a tour Okay, important teachings, the weak and the strong. Now, Paul utilizes a very cool argument uh, for church unity. And that is, he appeals to strong to accept the weak, because the weak cannot accept what the strong people are doing. And it has to do with eating meat sacrificed to idols. You know, Paul says, yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. But it is an idol. But you know what we should do? Instead of leading a brother to sin, we should just, whenever those brothers are around, we should give up uh, eating meat to idols, sacrifice to idols. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful argument because he's appealing to their ego. You know, he's like, he identifies them as strong and says, I'm like you, but I can give it up. So, um, the weak and strong argument, I think, is pretty smooth. And then there's the Lord's Supper. Okay, this is what you need to know about the Lord's Supper in Cor in the in First Corinthians. Now, it is the first historical recording of the Lord's Supper. So everything in the Gospels comes later. You know, Paul's writing this in 55, and that's when about the first uh, Gospel was written. You know, in Mark. So, uh, Paul beat him to the punch, and he gets to give us the first um, account of the Lord's Supper. And, incidentally, it's what uh, Baptist, most Baptists use, uh, or every Baptist church I've been a part of. They use the 1 Corinthians, um, the first Corinthians Lord's Supper because it has that admonition, you know, you uh, don't take this lightly uh, kind of uh, kind of deal from uh, 1 Corinthians. You need to examine yourself and uh, don't take of it unworthily. Uh, I even had a friend of mine one time, I was sick, and he said, have you been taking the Lord's Supper wrong? You know, and it can be a sickness in the church. You know, the whole church is doing it incorrectly. So, it's a very important teaching in Christianity. And also, the resurrection of the dead. Some people were uh, doubting the resurrection of the dead. And Paul basically says, you know, we're, we would be fools. Uh, if the Lord hasn't re resurrected from the dead, then nothing is true. Okay, major theological currents, and by currents I mean things that are flowing through the epistle. And we, I've already mentioned this, the unity of the church. And by unity, um, I mean, first of all, uh, Jews and Gentiles. You know, the Jews uh, were probably the people who uh, could not eat the meat that was, was sacrificed to idols. You know, it still has that um, that kosher dietary law thing, and it's very important that Paul here is upholding a Jewish tradition instead of making Jews give up something. He tells the Gentiles, "Hey, wherever we're around, just cut out the idol meat." 
So he didn't say, Jews, you just have to put up with this. So uh, I think that's something that is uh, critical to understand. The church as the body of Christ. Now, this is fun. Because the body of Christ metaphor, and that is the, the one body, many parts, um, that is used exclusively to unite rich and poor. And it's in favor of the rich. Um, the best usage of it, or best example, is when uh, there, there was a, uh, an army about to uh, wipe out a certain Roman city, and there was a great orchard there, and the, the uh, poor people of the city had been fighting in wars, and they were tired of doing it, so they told the rich people that they're not going to do anything. You know, whenever the invading army comes in, we're going to greet them and work out uh, peace with them and just let them come in here and take your stuff. You know, the poor people had nothing to lose. And the uh, great orator um, stood up and gave this wonderful speech about how the uh, city is the body and the wealthy are the head, and the poor are the hands and feet. And I'm not going to be ashamed of hands and feet, So, uh, but if the head is cut off, the feet and the hands die as well. So we need to act as if we're one body and face the threat. And the legend is that the poor people were convinced, and they fought as, uh, because they were convinced that they were one body. So there are other examples of this in ancient literature. So the really, I think, the only way to interpret it is that Paul is supporting the wealthy, the rich, in Corinth, and undermining the poor by telling them that they need to be unified and they are one body. And Christ, um, you know, Christ flows through the entire uh, the entire body. So, you know, we need each other. It's an argument for unity. And we do need unity between the rich and poor. Unfortunately, um, we're n we, when we have unity, the poor are still the ones that go out and fight. So, um, that's something that we need to work on. And then, uh, another form of unity is, uh, Salvation through Jesus Christ alone, and uh, baptism as being uh, one baptism. So we're, we are united with each other and united with Christ in baptism. And also in correct knowledge. Now, I did my dissertation on knowledge, on uh, wisdom, which is Sophia. And um, Paul was teaching that no matter what philosophy you have. You cannot reach God through it. You have to be, uh, you know, blessed with the Spirit of God. So he denounces a major tenet of philosophy, that philosophy can unify us with God. And, uh, but he uses um, Greco-Roman philosophy quite a bit. And also, uh, another aspect of unity is spiritual gifts. You know, we all have our gifts and they are used to uh, for the betterment of everybody. Whew. Second Corinthians. Um, we know, or it's undisputed, that it's written by Paul. Um, to Corinth, it's written to Corinth and all Achaia, which is basically Greece, and uh, its unity is disputed and the unity of 1 Corinthians is disputed. By unity, I mean, same thing with Romans. You know, there's, there was one scholar who found uh, 13 letters between 2 Corinthians and 1 Corinthians, and he scrambles them all up. You know, the um, first chapter goes with the 8th chapter, and the 11th chapter goes with the 2nd chapter. Um, you'd think, or at least I would think, a person like that belongs in a Looney Tunes house, but um, he's a famous scholar now.
So maybe uh, I can say something dumb and uh, become famous. But anyway, sorry about that. Uh, so he divides up 1 Corinthians into all these little parts. And for scholars who are into that kind of thing, they are fighting about what, which first goes where uh, because the arguments aren't that great. So, enough of my bias. I was really sorry. Okay, uh, theology of 2 Corinthians. Now, Paul's existence isn't possible. Um, in 1 Corinthians as well, um, Paul has to establish himself as a a legitimate apostle and the inference is some people in the community or outside the community it, they're challenging his apostleship or his right to preach the gospel and receive payment sometimes um, and they you know they criticize Paul for everything about his apostleship he taught that um, there is glory to being an apostle, but most of it is suffering. And the suffering is patterned after the suffering of Christ. You know, if Christ suffered, um, what makes me think that I'm not going to suffer? And Or, if Christ is suffers and I'm doing Christ's work, I can expect to suffer. So, uh, Paul is not ashamed at all to complain about his suffering. You know, he, he dedicated like an entire chapter to it in 1 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, apparently, he has to keep defending his apostleship. Uh, one thing that's also important is he's called by Jesus to be an apostle. And I think that one time he says, called by God. But this is always my favorite part of uh, Paul's letter in Greek, because I can read it easily. You know, Paul, called to be an apostle. That's exactly the way it is in Greek. Paul, called to be an apostle. So... I really love to see that. Um, but this being called by Jesus is something that is very important. You know, he's not called by churches. He wasn't called himself. He was called by Jesus. And uh, that's very important. Because um, he's saying he has a very special relationship with Jesus. You know, Jesus pointed at, at him and said, I want you to do this. You know, it's a divine inspiration. It's unshakable. Uh, you know, you can believe him or not. Something that he uses to argue that he's an apostle. And, as I said on this last point, uh, opponents challenge the nature of Paul's apostleship. And that's it. Um, the last part here is uh, the epistle to Romans. It's an outline. And uh, I will post um, the outlines to First and Second Corinthians. Um, I just didn't think that it was as cool as Romans at the time. So um, I will post that. And thank you for watching. Please let me know if you have any questions.